Good morning, my name's Jenny Smith and I'm the CEO of the uh, Council to Homeless Persons and I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming you all to this, our second virtual launch of uh, an edition of Parity. And even though uh, it's not unusual that we're uh, close to the end of June 2020, this is the May uh, 2020 edition on mental health, housing and homelessness. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands around Australia upon which we're meeting this morning and pay my uh, respects and acknowledge that this uh, land was never ceded. I don't want to go any further without uh, a, uh, also acknowledging that uh, parity can't help, can't happen without uh, sponsorship. And uh, to begin by th thanking our sponsors, uh, Mind Australia, Near My National, Co-Health, Wellways, Mica Projects, Uniting Victoria, TAS and Origin. Um, and in many cases, those sponsors have supported uh, our parity editor, uh, Noel Murray and Parity over many years. I'd also like to let you know that we're recording this session and uh, it will be uh, available on the CHP website uh, in the future. It is time uh, to take stock of the policy and practice developments around the country at the intersection of uh, mental health and homelessness. And in Victoria at uh, present, we are well into uh, the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health um, service system. And the interim findings from that were delivered uh, last year. And for many of us, they were um, of considerable concern. We're uh, incredibly supportive of the work of the Victorian government to make sure that the um, mental health system works to meet the needs of people who need it most. However, we are particularly concerned about the, to date at least, apparent lack of understanding that, uh, that we saw in the interim report of the centrality of the provision of safe, secure and affordable housing to meeting the mental health needs of people, especially those experiencing homelessness. And so this concern is reflected in many of the contributions to this edition from right across the country. Um, these concerns are shared across sectors and they are about the fundamental need to make housing provision a priority in the further development of our mental health service system. So we're incredibly fortunate this morning uh, to have Minister Martin Foley with us uh, to launch, to formally launch this edition. Um, Martin has in the past been our Victorian Minister for Housing and he continues to be the Minister for Mental Health and it is in that capacity uh, today uh, that he joins us. Um, Minister Foley's been uh, a member of the Legisl Legislative Assembly for Albert Park since 2007 and since the election of the Andrews government, he's been Minister for Housing, Disability, Ageing, and then and now Minister for Mental Health Quality and Creative Industries. Uh, Minister Foley, it's just wonderful to have you here with us today and uh, to have the opportunity to hear from you. And so over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Jenny. And uh, can I thank the council for homeless persons for uh, the outstanding and enduring leadership that you all show um, when it comes to housing and homelessness. And can I particularly thank uh, Noel for his uh, enduring work on parity. And parity is more than just a uh, important journal for the council and for the issues of housing and homelessness but it's that opportunity for advocacy and policy development that uh, is shared widely across not just the non-government organizations not just government but equally people who've experienced homelessness and uh, for the purposes of today the uh, well and truly deep embedded relationship between homelessness housing stress and mental illness. Um, I also begin by acknowledging that we meet here, we all virtually meet here somewhere on the lands of the first peoples of this continent. And I'm particular where I am, want to acknowledge the people of the Kula Nation and particularly uh, the Wurundjeri. And in doing so, just pause to reflect that it's our indigenous brothers and sisters who are 
disproportionately overrepresented in both the measures of uh, mental ill health and uh, the issues of housing and homeless homelessness. And uh, there are many prospects to resolving that, but uh, it's not for me to point to perhaps other than uh, the statement from the heart and the work that uh, this government is particularly doing on treaty on treaties, the first people assemblies, and in the absence of any national leadership on that space, the important work that I'd like to think we can do as a community beyond Victoria, but certainly within Victoria. I've got a really nice set of notes from the department that's got a long list of um, all the um, contributions that we've made in the crossover between mental health and homelessness and um, housing and touches on the NDIS. But I thought rather than uh, read a um, very well written set of uh, media release uh, lines, that given the quality of the organisations on this hookup and the limited time I've got, that perhaps what I might do is just reflect on some of the issues that you've touched on, Jenny, in those initial comments. And to do so through the prism of the fact that we are now um, understanding what the COVID normal reality that we are entering into. And in, at the moment in Victoria with um, uh, a small but um, concerning spike in the COVID uh, infections, what that is teaching us about the fact that we are going to have to live with this, this different set of uh, realities for some time. And those COVID realities are amplifying so many of the disadvantages and uh, uh, harms that our society had going into this crisis. Not only are they amplifying them, they are now adding new layers of complexity and different cohorts of our fellow citizens uh, into um, those issues of housing and homelessness and for the purposes of today, uh, the, the issues around mental ill health. So if we had a mental health and all of its various intersections, particularly housing and homelessness, if we had a crisis in those areas in February this year, before the boom came down with COVID, the last four to five months have shown us that we are uh, amplifying that crisis weekly. And with projections of substantial job losses, uh, and we know that the implications that they have on uh, homelessness and housing, and we know what the projections that we've seen in some quarters for what that means in mental ill health, we know that this issue is only going to get uh, more significant for us. So what are the policy and programmatic responses that we need to do in, in order to not just do more of the same, but of course, doing more of the same uh, is uh, in regards to what works is certainly uh, very important, particularly when it comes to more provisions of uh, housing support, when it comes to provisions of uh, specialist and targeted support uh, and areas uh, whether it be through a gender lens, a dis uh, Indigenous lens, a disability lens, uh, a family violence lens, there are many points in which housing, homelessness and mental ill health come together. But what we do have is an opportunity through a number of tectonic plates shifting around the policy landscape at the moment. Jenny touched on one with the Victorian Royal Commission into Mental Health. And the other, from a number of other ones, uh, would be the Productivity Commission's report due this week to be um, provided to the federal government. They have then some 25 federal parliamentary sitting days to, ta to table that. But equally, the fact that uh, on the national cabinet structures, um, following some representations from uh, Victoria and New South Wales, oddly enough, um, the fact that mental ill health and uh, issues around responses to that and stimulus, uh, economic stimulus, have managed to get in a structured way onto the, that national cabinet agenda. So I just want to briefly touch on those three areas 
in the short time and um, uh, seek to not reassure, but point to paths of what I would hope to be constructive engagement between um, the housing and homelessness peaks and sectors, but uh, more importantly, the myriad of uh, groups and supporters of the council who are out there uh, at the coalface of responding to uh, consumers and families and clients in communities, in place, uh, uh, where housing, homelessness, economic disadvantage, poverty and mental ill health all come together in place and in people's lives. The Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System, uh, as Jenny indicated, um, didn't in its uh, interim report go into great lengths when it came to the issue of the links between housing and um, uh, mental health. It is reflected in the terms of reference uh, of the Commission. Uh, COVID also set them back, so we've pushed the date of the Royal Commission reporting back to the 5th of February. Uh, I am confident from the reports that they touched on in their interim report, but more importantly, the work that they've done since the um, interim report, that the Commission understands uh, more deeply uh, as its work has transpired, the rich intersections between the array of expressions of mental ill health and the range of other social policy issues, but particularly when it comes to uh, the bedrock of which safe, affordable, secure housing provides. Um, the uh, issue of parity today uh, certainly points to that in um, both lived experience and policy um, detail, and I'm sure that that will be welcomed by the Commission. But what we uh, uh, also need to understand is when it comes to the Commission's work is that it's how from housing and how from the overlay of mental ill health responses, it then needs to engage in a, in a raft of other shift of services away from the clinical, away from the institutional uh, tertiary levels, or indeed away from what we've successfully managed to achieve instead of huge great institutions on the hills that we may have had from the, fifth, you know, from the last century, to, to be brutal about it, a whole series of mini institutions tucked away in the suburbs and the countryside um, with much of the same culture. And it is only by securing people in communities with support, and the bedrock of that is housing, that the overall direction that clearly the Commission is heading in when it comes to shifting support and services into a more community-based uh, service location, whilst also dealing with the issues around acute mental ill health, that housing will necessarily need to become a part of the equation. The fact that that same uh, direction was certainly a report was reflected in the Productivity Commission's interim uh, draft report, rather, um, in, in October of last year, and there necessarily economic participation lens, which showed something like, for Victoria alone, $13 billion impact of what mental ill health does to the Victorian economy and in the um, uh, more than $70 billion worth of impact uh, on the national economy every year. It is from their work, uh, a very sensible engagement to invest uh, in different models of uh, consumer supported, integrated housing and mental health support. Having then linked that into a COVID emergency response, which saw uh, in a very um, strange way, a dual response out there in the mental health community whereby Frontline community, triaging, phone-based, web-based services have um, taken off in the amount of demand that they have had to deal with, both from existing uh, consumers and a whole new group of people who have come into the system. 
Yet at the same time, many community-based services and many um, clinical-based services saw a massive drop-off of people with mental uh, ill health issues from their services. And in many regards, people disappeared from their, our systems, disappeared from supports. And in response to that, um, uh, at the pushing of a couple of states, the National Cabinet has put together uh, now a National Pandemic uh, Mental Health Response Plan, which touches uh, on some of these issues. Uh, and that, with a bit more of push from the states in particular, um, we are confident we'll see in the National Recovery Strategy through both the economic stimulus provisions around pushes for uh, the prospect of particularly social and affordable housing being a key component of that, but to integrate that with the um, uh, mental ill health responses together with uh, the NDIS and a range of other well and truly cooked up policy proposals that lack the resources, the political coordination and the will to drive them through. It just strikes me that uh, this sector of bringing together into an integrated manner through the prism of housing, person-centred, place-based, community-based solutions of which, uh, from a mental health perspective, there is now an unprecedented coming together of opportunities. Opportunity doesn't mean a guaranteed result. But if you've got the structures, if you've got the campaigning, and if you've got the organisational grunt to make sure that these moving pieces land in an appropriate way in the forthcoming months ahead, then I think that is an opportunity too important for not just the Council for the Homeless, not just states, not just the Commonwealth, but the entire Australian community who are all touched by the issues of mental ill health, whereby one in two of us during the course of our lifetime will have a treatable mental illness, where one in five of us in any given year will have an episode of mental illness, and where somewhere around three to four percent of that group of Australians will, through their mental ill health, face a housing crisis. We are talking this issue touching every Australian in some direct lived experience manner. And they're just now, we are on the cusp of opportunities, but opportunities don't turn into results without campaigning, without advocacy, and without strong support. And in that regard, uh, I know that the Council for Homeless, and of course, Parity as the voice of that uh, organisation will be at the forefront of holding the political class's feet to the flame. And I look forward to that prospect, um, not just warming my toes, but um, landing in some outcomes of real tangible policy reform, program delivery and resource allocation. So I think the next uh, few years, whilst going to be extraordinarily challenging, prevent uh, uh, unprecedented opportunity for the kind of work and leadership that the council has um, so long advocated for and has so long managed to be at the forefront of uh, change and innovation. And I look forward to that continuing to be the case as these real opportunities come together. So I might leave it at that, Jenny, given that I bang on too much, but um, uh, there are exciting times but really challenging times ahead of us all. Many thanks Minister and uh, thanks so much for speaking off the cuff if you like. I think you just cheered us up uh, <laughs> but I think you also uh, made it pretty clear <laughs> that as usual nothing will come easily and without a great deal more effort on all of our behalves. But um, I've often described you as uh, uh, the minister who gets what we do. And uh, I think your, um, uh, your comments today are, uh, certainly um, are influencing our work plan uh, for the next little while. So uh, thank you so much for being here this morning and for formally launching this edition 
of parity and we look forward to continue to work with you to get those integrated outcomes to which you've alluded. Um, Thanks guys, have a good day. Thanks. I look forward to seeing it up on the web. See you Good all. on you. Good on you. Um, this edition of Parity, like uh, most others, is just jam packed with you know really high quality articles. And uh, our Parity editor, Noel Murray, does a great job with Parity and bringing together each community of interest um, to deliver on each edition. And absolutely nothing I can do can stop Noel applying the same principle to these launches. Um, and so what that means is that this launch is jam packed with uh, exceptional speakers, um, each of whom I would be perfectly happy to sit here and listen to for an hour just on their own. Uh, but it, that is not what we have. Um, we just have too much of a good thing this morning. So I'm going to have to be ruthless in the way that I uh, continue to move this uh, launch event along or well, none of us will ever get back uh, to our desks. Um, now, as you know, CHP is committed to undertaking everything that it does in partnership with those uh, who are or who have been without uh, a home. And uh, in this launch, uh, our next uh, focus will be a short discussion with Nigel Pernu, um, who is a graduate of uh, the Council to Homeless Persons Peer Education and Support Program, or PESP. Um, Nigel has been working with us since 2018 uh, and, and I'm, I'm lucky quite a little bit with me as well over that um, course of the time. He's, uh, Nigel's got an interest in filmmaking, I know he can cook and uh, he would like to use this platform to uh, further people's understanding of the issues around health, mental health and homelessness into the future. So Nigel, lovely to see you and uh, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. I'm going to ask you uh, a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so can you tell us how the experience of homelessness impacted on your mental health and well-being? Um, yeah, I was, uh, um, and with, um, I had an undiagnosed mental health condition, so that was pretty harsh. I mean, and I, I got support from Mind. They're a supported accommodation, and I found that to be really, really useful. Um, they were really kind. They were, uh, they listened to to you and all that sort of stuff. So all the important things. So yeah, yeah. So um, it was great to have that support there. It was, yeah. yeah. And they also helped me access the NDIS, which has been really, really important for me uh, going forward. I've like uh, been able to uh, get employment and uh, psychological counselling, all that sort of stuff. So Yeah. And so when you became um, homeless and didn't have a home, what, how did, what did that do to you um, in terms of your mental health? Um, well, my um, experience was... Uh, uh, a physical illness so um, I lost my job I lost the place that I was living um, my relationships sort of broke down um, yeah all, all that sort of stuff so awesome. all fell apart yeah exactly yeah, yeah. well um, you, you have had a home for quite a while now yeah uh, about two or three years yeah, so can you tell us how that's made a difference to your mental health and well-being? Oh, it's been, it's been a life-changing um, event for me. Like, having been housed for like two and a half, three years now, um, I've been able to get employment, I've been able to get counselling, I've been able to uh, do education. So, yeah, I've found it really, really useful. Yeah, okay. And... Um, what, 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 what is your life like now, now that you've got a... It's a lot calmer. There's a lot less chaos in my life. Um, there's, um, yeah, it feels like I'm, I'm re-entering the normal, normal, um, normal lifestyle or the normal world. So, yeah, it's really good. I mean, yeah. like, I, one of the things I had just, what I wanted to say was, the rate of new start was one of the things that made it really difficult to live. Yeah. Um, 
back when I was experiencing my well, serious mental health condition, um, I was yeah living in a house like most people, but paying too much for rent. And, you know, there's only $20 left over for food and medication in the end. Um, yeah, and that, that was in no way helpful to my mental health. Um, you couldn't really do anything while I'm su surviving on that. So, Yeah. And are you on the um, job seeker now? I'm on the DSP. I, that's something oh, that yeah. had really helped me with the, the NDIS. Yep. So I was able to see a psychologist and through that I yep. got on the NDIS, uh, to the DSP. Yeah. So the, the um, higher, more stable income and the access to the NDIS support has made a big difference for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Nigel. It's lovely to see you and you see, you. see you going so well. Thanks. Good to Thanks see you. Thanks so much for sharing your story with us today. It's fantastic. No problem. Um, and do stay with us if you would like to. Um, so we move on now to uh, the next part of the launch where we are fortunate uh, to have a number of key mental health and homelessness sector leaders uh, to identify what they believe are the main challenges that they face in meeting the housing and support needs of people experiencing homelessness who also have uh, mental health issues. And uh, in five minutes or less, we've asked each of these leaders to respond to the same question, which is what models of housing and support would work best to meet the needs of people with mental health issues who are experiencing homelessness? So it's about models of housing and support. Our first presenter is Sarah Pollock, and uh, Sarah is the Executive Director of Research and Advocacy at Mind Australia. Um, she has had uh, experience as an executive in community services and mental health sectors over 15 years, and uh, she's had a particular focus on working with people from different sorts of marginalised communities. Uh, most recently, she's led a, a two-year program of research in partnership with Uhuri on the intersections between mental health and housing and homelessness. So Sarah, uh, great to have you here with us this morning. Thanks for um, uh, mind support for the edition and uh, very interested to hear about Mind's view about housing and support models. Thanks, Jenny. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, it's great to see so many people online. What, I will be talking, what, I, what I'll be talking about this morning is actually drawn from the two-year program of work that Jenny's just referred to, which was a multi, multiple streams of research, uh, so quantitative, qualitative, work with service providers, evidence review, uh, looking at that intersection between ha housing, homelessness and mental health. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the resilience the ingenuity, the good grace and the generosity of the more than 140 people that we talked to across Australia about their experiences of, of mental health and housing. Um, I think, and in answering the question, what I'd like to do is rather than go directly to models, is put forward a conceptual framework, because I actually think one of the things we need to do is to, is to be able to clearly conceptualise uh, what the housing what the intersecting housing and mental health need is. Um, so from our trajectories research, we've been able to, and, and sort of reflecting and analysing that, we've been able to come up with four different groups of people who need a housing plus support response on the basis of their mental health. So first of all, there are people who are adequately housed and going along okay until they become unwell. And then things can deteriorate very rapidly and very quickly. So they need support to maintain their tenancy during a period of illness, in the time that they're becoming unwell through the illness and in the time afterwards. The second group of people are people who actually need a medium term intensive housing plus support response. They, they, they need more assistance for longer, uh, and we would say anywhere between two and five years. We've got, we've got models in place that, that provide people with housing and support for up to a couple of years, for instance, CCUs or some of our extended parks. But what if you're not ready to go in, into sort of lighter, lighter support environments then? 
Um, and I would say one of the things that's critical about that model is that the housing continues as the support diminishes. So the housing stays consistent. Not like the old models of transitional housing or adult resi rehab, where when you've had your time, off you go. Cycle starts all over again. Uh, if you still need a housing and support response after five years, then you are then you are NDIS eligible. That's what we would argue. So the third group are the people who need long-term housing plus support, either through SIL or possibly SDA. SDA is a greatly underexplored area, I think, for people with psychosocial disability. And the fourth group are people who are persistently homeless. Now I understand that there are overlaps between those groups. They're not pure groups. And system failure in any one of those groups creates many more people in one of the other groups. We have kept in this fourth group of people who are persistently homeless because I actually think that some of the characteristics of those people, for instance, the amount of trauma, the length of trauma, the likely AOD use, and an extremely complex support needs and often very poor physical health actually mark them out for, for a specialist homelessness response. Uh, whereas the other three, I think, can be provided through, through a collaboration response or even a mental health response. So although we can identify those four different groups, what we've seen in our research is that the sorts of supports they need are the same. In for, e for each of the four groups, they might vary in, in they might vary in intensity, or duration, or in the combination that you need that, that someone needs them. But very quickly, they are access first and foremost. If you do not have this, nothing else will work. Full stop. Access to safe, secure, affordable, and appropriate housing. That goes on. That that goes with you. Not you having to move to find something else. You need a house. You need rapid access to tenancy support when things go wrong. You need rapid access to clinical mental health care when things go wrong as early as possible in, in when the wheels start to wobble. You need access to, to wraparound psychosocial and other health supports that focus on practical issues and more than just mental health and housing. The stuff that helps you build a meaningful life, the stuff that helps you maintain your relationships, the stuff that helps you have good, you know, good, interesting things to do. You also, people also need support coordination or care coordination and assistance to navigate across multiple systems. They need connection to a trusted worker. When we talk to people across Australia, it basically didn't matter whether it's a housing worker, a mental health worker, a community worker, if you had one worker that, that believed you and you trusted, you tended to do much better. We need much more trauma counselling. We need much more psychological, therapeutic counselling, particularly trauma counselling, that can help people deal with the underlying reasons that often drive their poor mental health. And their, and their difficulties maintaining housing. And we also need to pay attention to financial security. Those are features that, that we need to see provided for all of those groups. But like I said, in, in, in different combinations. Just in closing, I would, I cannot, I can't leave this without saying families and carers often get forgotten. They are often the housing provider of last resort things are pretty crap for them. This, as we think about mental health and housing responses, we must also think about the families of people who need a specific mental health and housing response. And we also need to make sure that, that uh, there are enough variations for delivery to be culturally appropriate. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Many thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks for that, uh, you know, very clear articulation of a very sensible model. I do apologise, I think my um, internet might be a little bit wobbly and that's uh, causing the crackle that uh, has emerged. I don't, I think if I try and do anything about it, <laughs> it could lead to disaster. But um, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, that is eminently uh, useful and sensible. Our next Kessa. presenter is uh, Joe Kasser, who's the General Manager of Business and Service Development at Nehemiah National and uh, 
Over the last 30 years, Joe has worked in program development and service delivery roles right across community, local government, mental health and homelessness service sectors. And a common thread in his work uh, has been seeking to support people to access and participate more fully in community life. And Joe, it's uh, great to have you with us and uh, to hear Near My National's perspective uh, in relation to housing and support models. Mm. Thanks, Jenny. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come along and speak today. And also, um, yeah, thanks to Noel. It's been a pleasure working with Noel over the years and, um, you know, contributing to, to parity and, and to the work, you know, you're doing in the sector. Um, look, the first thing I think I'd say is um, to preface that the housing and support models that NEMI has you know, predominantly been involved in, has um, probably fitted neatly in Sarah's fourth category um, that she was speaking about in terms of people that um, have got a serious mental illness, um, have had long-term homelessness, have um, been rough sleepers, um, and that's sort of been the area that we've tended to work in, and they're the models and of housing and support that I can speak to today in terms of what we've seen that, you know, has had value and, and has worked. And I suppose our experience over the last 10 years has come from working with people with a serious mental illness in housing and support and that sort of psychosocial recovery, you know, orientation. And um, over that 10 year period, we, we've worked in supporting people, rough sleepers, in getting off the street. So um, the Way to Home program in Sydney, there's been the Wadumba Willem program in, in Melbourne, which has supported Aboriginal people experiencing mental health you know, issues and homelessness. Um, we've had a, um, a, a 33 bed unit in uh, Bell Street, Preston, with uh, half people who have come off the waiting list, you know, the department's waiting list and the other half, people with this, you know, mental illness, have been homeless and I suppose in more recent years there's been all the homes so the street to homes in Adelaide the tour time in Melbourne um, and I think there's home to stay now in, in, um, in New South Wales so we've got about 10 or 11 programs that have developed over that period and they've been in the main working in that fourth group that Sarah was um, you know so well describing just earlier um, I suppose underpinning you know, the work that we've done or underpinning the models is that sort of full citizenship that, you know, people with mental illness, people who have experienced homelessness, um, you know, our work is to support full citizenship, you know, in the community and, and that they're residents and have got rights, you know, it's a human rights, you know, um, issue. Um, what we know, I think, you know, following what Sarah was saying again, that um, housing first principles work and that they're foundational and that really our models need to, we describe it as uh, homefulness, that people need to feel safe, they need to feel connected and they need to be able to do the things that matter to them. Um, you know, as Nigel was talking about just earlier, um, you know, to the group. Um, that I think, like Sarah, we've found that in this fourth group, that longitud longitudinal support is important. So you, you can't work with people um, that have had long histories and often there's trauma. So I think in our Wadumba Willem program, we've found that the bulk of the clients that we work with have, have had five or more significant experiences of trauma, you know, in, in their background. Um, I think for us, when we look at that, we um, look at programs like Journey to Social Inclusion, you know, that the Sacred Heart Mission um, has so well articulated and our experience has been similar, that it's about trust, again, which Sarah was pointing to, that you need to develop trust, you need to develop relationships and then you can start to work on skill development and you can start to work on connection to community and like what Nigel pointed to earlier, you can start to then look at work or, or training or, you know, other things that are, that are work, you know, that are appropriate to you in your life. Um, I think the 
three things that sort of underpin um, successful models that we've seen is one, I think, um, uh, you know, something that Minister Foley was talking about earlier, we need integrated approaches. And I think in all the programs that we've looked at, there's been an integration that has resulted in wraparound support for the client. So from way to home, where you're talking about the city of Sydney and the inner suburbs and the state government and housing and, you know, private sector and other NGOs collaborating um, through to, um, you know, the Adelaide Project Zero, which is, you know, the Don Dunstan Foundation state government, again, the civic NGO community, um, that that um, is crucial in people being able to access support that they need um, and where the, you know, where that might go. I think the second thing um, is system level collaborations, um, that they're crucial. And I think it's instructive, I know at a, at a you know, a, a homelessness forum that you put on a couple of years ago, Jenny, we had the Finland example. And, you know, that, that country has almost eradicated homelessness. And uh, thank goodness for that, given the, you know, the winters that they have there. But, you know, they had a, they had a big problem like the rest of Europe. And again, that was um, partnerships with state, local, civic, local communities, um, turning off the tap at the source, um, housing first, and you don't then get the long, you know, the traumatic events and the histories and, and, and the problems that we're dealing with. Um, and we've seen that, you know, I think in South Australia with the Adelaide Zero, Don Dunstan Foundation, and we've seen that with, you know, establishing Australian Alliance to End Homelessness in Sydney, the In Street Sleeping Collaborations. So there's something about broad um, collabor system-wide collaborations. I think the third thing that I'd say and that we've found is that data-led interventions and, you know, research, you know, such, such as the stuff that Sarah is doing with Uhuri, crucial. And, that you know, what we've found in uh, the Adelaide Zero project, you know, with the by name list and having a by name list means that you know who those people are, you know, where their locations are, you can start to link people to services. You can start to tailor the support. Again, like what Sarah was pointing to, that it's not a homogeneous group and there's different sort of interventions required and that having that data is, is crucial. And I think um, it also helps to support design of the housing and support initiatives. So, and I, I think, you know, like the COVID has seen that so that there's been lots of people taken from the streets and now it's like, well, what are the interventions that we can look at now to keep people from falling back into homelessness and, you know, ensure that there's interventions going forward. And I suppose finally I'd like to shout out to um, Wellways and their Doorways program, which I think is a, a fantastic intervention looking at real estate. So we need a range of interventions and data will help us to understand that. And, um, we know also from the data that of street sleepers, 80% of the clients in Adelaide are people with a serious mental illness, 80% uh, are, are experiencing physical health, 80% are experiencing AOD, and 55% are experiencing a mix of all three. Um, so I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Joe, for um, sharing uh, the NEMI perspective. And I think you'll be hearing um, the terms for citizenship, homefulness and longitudinal support coming out of my mouth a little bit more frequently. So thanks for your um, uh, assistance with those and also for uh, providing uh, the perfect segue to introduce yeah. uh, Laura Collister, uh, the, the CEO of uh, Wellways Australia and she has been since the end of last year and uh, having previously been Director of uh, Services Research and Development and uh, Prior to joining Wellways, Laura was a lecturer at La Trobe and had a leading role in uh, developing the university's mental health curriculum. And I'm pretty confident Laura and I met when we were both working in uh, the psychiatric services of the late 1980s and 90s, where Laura was assisting residents to prepare for community living. So Laura, thanks for your support. Thanks for being here today. And uh, we look forward to hearing the Wellways view about housing and support. <laughs> 
Thanks, Jenny. Um, before I start, um, I will acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet upon and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and affirm um, my commitment and my recognition of their emerging leaders and my commitment to work with them in partnership into the future. Um, following Sarah and Joe, who have stolen most of my thunder, <laughs> it's, um, I um, have prepared uh, a different angle, I guess, on, to answer your question, Jenny. Um, there's a lot that we all know and probably everybody in this room knows about the centrality of housing, that it's a fundamental foundation upon which people can build recovery. We also know that mental health support for a lot of people is an absolutely critical component. And as Sarah said, that this support um, often needs to be counted in years and not months for some people. Um, all of us sitting in this room, I think, recognise that the systems and the context of which we work means that housing agencies often do not have the um, resources to offer mental health support in an ongoing kind of way, the nature that Sarah and Joe have talked about. And equally, mental health agencies do not have access to rapid housing at all. Um, so, I mean, those sorts of facts in my mind um, are self-evident. We don't need any more evidence to support the, these approaches. Joe mentioned doorway, and so I wanted to speak briefly about doorway. Most people probably in the room have heard about doorway. It uses private rental as an accommodation um, option for people who experience significant mental health issues. Um, it uses private rental as um, an option because in our mind, it is an underutilized kind of option for people. Certainly it isn't the only option. Um, or a solution for all people. But it is a solution that we've put forward and fortunately the state government has funded us to support people into private rental. One of the critical components of that is a relationship that is made with the real estate agents um, in the community. And it's that angle that I wanna take in, th in thinking about the sorts of models that in my experience work. Um, Doorway is built on, on a partnership with clinical mental health services, um, Wellways as a mental health provider, and these real estate agents in the community. When we first opened Doorway, not every real estate agent wanted to work with us at all, particularly real estate agents in small communities who knew the people that we were actually working with, and some of them were on the real estate agent blacklist meaning that these people were known to be not good candidates for private rental at all. We at Wellways set about working with those real estate, real estate agents to change attitudes. We had an absolute deliberate, deliberate strategy to not only change their attitudes, but change their behaviour towards the group of people we were helping. How did we do that? We worked in partnership with them. We we worked with them so that they would see a person that they were finding accommodation for, not somebody who was a problem, somebody who was homeless, someone who had a mental illness, somebody who had drug issues, et cetera, et cetera, a familiar story I know. We did that by providing really positive, supportive interactions with people who we were trying to find accommodation for. And this didn't happen overnight, but now, a number of years into the Doorway program, we have real estate agents who positively discriminate to find suitable, affordable, safe accommodation for the cohort that we are trying to work with and we are working with. They seek us out and say, we have accommodation that would be perfect for the people that you are working with. And over time, they've developed their confidence as our tenants have developed their confidence to work directly with real estate agents without wellways being in the middle of that interaction. And I think that's really important. So we see real estate agents in the community as a critical asset towards delivering the doorway program. So when Noel asked me to write this opinion piece, I thought about what I could possibly talk about. 
and I reflected on a very personal experience that I have in my local community. I live in inner city Melbourne and there were um, or there are some developments happening in some vacant, what were vacant blocks of land very close to where I live. And they are those sorts of developments where you have a number of small modular style homes being set up on vacant land. And um, we, I was involved in my local neighbourhood, I am involved in my local neighbourhood, and was really distressed to see the reaction of our neighbourhood to these emerging developments. There was a group that was formed in my street that was about petitioning the local council to keep those people out of our neighbourhood. They used every excuse to talk about car parking issues, crowding issues, um, quality of housing issues, the whole lot. They worked with the council, they attended community meetings and they did everything they possibly can to stop these developments. The buildings are being built. There are many of them that are nearing kind of occupation, I think. And we still have this undercurrent in our community that's been going on for, I don't know, 18 months to two years, that is not about welcoming these people at all into our neighbourhood. I am really concerned and somewhat distressed that a group of people are going to be given a house, they're going to be supported in their house, and yet we have a community, my community, that is not in a position to welcome, include, enable them to feel belonged or at all put out a hand of friendship or welcoming. My community is diverse. We have things like welcome wagons for refugee communities that are settling in our area but we have failed to change the attitudes or to change the willingness of our community to, community to embrace these new neighbours. So what I would say is, is that housing is absolutely critical, that support is absolutely critical, but there's this missing piece that how are we working at a community level with local neighbourhoods to welcome people into their houses? because it's only if we have that community piece that the full citizenship that Joe was talking about, that Nigel mentioned, is going to be possible. And without that, recovery is not possible either. So I, I would love the conversation to change into, there are three things that are needed. There is housing, there is support, and there is a welcoming community if we're going to really break this cycle. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, it's lovely to have you involved and, uh, you know, thanks for um, sharing uh, the evidence-based uh, Successful Doorways program in uh, the private rental space and the comments about uh, relationships with uh, real estate agents, uh, but also uh, uh, the importance of the community development component of what we're doing, but also the, I think the challenge of congregate arrangements and, and how much preferable it is to, to, to maximise the um, um, availability for people to be spread with their different strengths throughout our um, community where at all possible. Um, so thanks heaps. Um, our next speaker is uh, Bronwyn Pike, uh, the CEO of Uniting Vic Taz and uh, Bronwyn has extensive experience across public, private and community service sectors but uh, Bronwyn is uh, best known to us really as having been the Victorian State Member of Parliament for Melbourne uh, over 13 years and, and including uh, 11 years in uh, ministerial roles as Minister for Housing, Aged Care, Community Services, Health and Education and Skills. And Bronwyn, uh, thank you so much for your support and uh, really looking forward to hearing from your experience both as um, uh, a former Minister for Housing and uh, across community services about uniting TAS's view about housing and support. Thanks, Bronwyn. Thanks very much, Jenny, and hi, everyone. Uh, great to see some familiar faces, and in fact, probably people who've been working with government for years and years on homelessness strategies um, and, you know, trying to address uh, long term often intractable problems. Um, 
what I've, of course, heard, like I think we've all heard, is there's huge consensus in this group about, you know, what we need. Housing first, wrapped around services, uh, long-term adequate support, um, the underpinning of um, adequate income protection, all of these things I think everybody has signed up to. So what I want to just briefly pick up on in fact, our Minister Foley's comments about opportunities, um, because I think um, we've all uh, recognised that um, the COVID experience is probably creating a kind of a new normal for many people uh, within the community. And hopefully there are things that we can build on, um, opportunities that have been realised that we thought could never be realised in this context. And we can kind of bottle those things and think about what it might mean for what we um, do into the future. Laura actually touched on one of the ones that was on my list, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I guess the first thing we've seen is that um, government can kind of act very, very quickly when it has to. Things that people thought were impossible, things that been people have been lobbying for, for years, suddenly get turned around really, really quickly. Doubling of job seeker, creating of a, a job job keeper keeper uh, payment, um, things like telehealth. People like me have been banging on about telehealth in the health sector for years and years. And whoopee, you know, it's up and running. It uh, changes people's experience of their relationship with the health sector. Things can happen very quickly. We can change very quickly. Um, how many of us have become experts at Zoom and Teams and all of those sort of things that we, you know, and learning all these little tricks and ways of relating that we, you know, hadn't really needed to do as much in the past and now we're kind of all experts. So, you know, we can do things. We can do them really quickly and um, we can kind of point that out and use this as a new platform for um, advocacy and lobbying and showing people that things can change. We can collaborate very quickly. You know, who thought there'd be a national cabinet that would um, be meeting uh, once a fortnight, um, would be making national decisions, would be able to put aside, hopefully, for a longer term than just now, um, you know, some of the kind of entrenched partisan um, differences that there are. And thirdly, I want to pick up on Laura's comment about changes in society and changes in community attitudes. Um, Laura, I thought you were describing my life as a minister because I can tell you that every time I wanted to uh, put up a homeless service, a, you know, a, a community-based juvenile justice response, um, housing for people with disabilities, anything that, you know, people thought was threatening about their own kind of personal security was always opposed and you know people were very sophisticated at drawing upon planning laws and all sorts of things to tell you why it wasn't going to be the best idea to have these people near them in the end it was really just about lack of understanding prejudice self-interest um, and all of those things that many of us have had to uh, fight against but you know the COVID-19 has kind of touched so many people's lives and brought a new group of people, people who thought they were secure, people, um, you know, who thought they had a job for life, um, people who never would have thought that they would be relying on government money or lining up for um, food parcels are now finding themselves in very changed circumstances. I see this as an opportunity for people to hopefully have a deeper understanding of what need is really all about in our community. You know, post the depression in the 30s, our society developed a welfare state because we didn't think that we were the kind of community that wanted to see people die of starvation, which is what was happening. Um, and then, you know, over time, we've developed this ideology of the deserving and the undeserving poor. And we've kind of blamed people for the fact that they might be ill or homeless or needing government support through social security. I hope that during COVID, people's personal experiences and broader understanding of it, sometimes things happen to us and it's not our fault. 
it's just the way life is. It's a, it's a disease. It's a, you know, an illness. Um, it's a one paycheck away from homelessness. It's a childhood trauma. And that we can kind of build on this changed understanding in our community and invite people to be more tolerant and um, in a sense invite the whole community on that journey of advocacy that we've been on for many many years and the organizations who have been represented here um, have been um, engaged um, in for many many years so i'm really delighted that uniting's part of um, this uh, particular issue of parity that we're a, a sponsor and um, of course um, you know our, our commitment goes um, in all these very practical areas but let's let's make the best of um, what can hopefully be some new opportunities um, into the future to change the the life stories for the people that we really care about thanks Jenny many thanks Bronwyn and uh, um, I really welcome um, your encouragement and optimism for what we all might achieve at this um, time of considerable change in our community and hopefully get uh, the results that we want in terms of housing and support for the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, and thanks so much for your uh, support. Our next uh, presenter is Nicole Bartholomews, who is the Chief Executive of uh, CoHealth. Uh, Nicole's worked extensively in public health and government for over 20 years and, and has a background uh, as a clinician uh, as well as uh, having an MBA. Um, she's got a strong interest in health policy service planning and design and so it's great to have CoHealth uh, on board with this edition and to have the perspective of a major frontline health service provider uh, to some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in our community uh, and to hear about CoHealth's view about the, the models of housing and support that we need. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for the invitation to speak at today's launch. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people uh, as the traditional owners on the land in which I stand today and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. CoHealth is so proud to be supporting this edition of Parity and I'd like to give particular thanks to Nigel for sharing his experience earlier. His voice and contribution enriches this conversation. When I saw the topic for today's address, it occurred to me that the answers to this question are as diverse and varied as the people that we work with. There's no one size that fits all solution. Uh, for the people that we work with, and yet there are some commonalities amongst the needs of all consumers. Critical to a person's recovery is addressing both a person's mental health and housing needs, and you can ha cannot have one without the other. So coming from a large community health service, um, I bring a unique perspective of integrating physical health, mental health, and social support services. In the past year, we provided services to over 46,000 consumers, which includes 1,600 clients who experience homelessness. Interestingly, of the 46,000 consumers who use our service, nearly 9% identify as experiencing insecure housing, a rate well in excess of the Victorian rate of homelessness of 41.9 for every 10,000 people. It's well established that people with poor mental health have far worse physical health outcomes. And I can't recall the number of uh, people or clients that I've heard say that they've been to five, six, seven GPs seeking physical health care and for these, these care needs to be overlooked because of their mental illness. Our holistic care model integrates all aspects of health and also focuses on the social drivers of poor health, including housing, poverty and social isolation. Our purpose is to support vulnerable people who would not otherwise access high quality health care and social support services. An example of our work is our clinic um, in Melbourne CBD, who has a particular focus on working with people who are experiencing homelessness and the services provided uh, here from a range of practitioners acknowledge the breadth of care that those clients require. I'd like to share a story of someone that CoHealth works with. Um, his name is Patrick 
and highlights his journey with us to find the keys to unlocking his recovery. Patrick's story demonstrates that these keys are not easy to find and do not fit perfectly every time. Patrick has a complex background, which includes chronic homelessness over three decades, complex mental illness and other physical health issues, and cycling has been cycling through crisis accommodation and hospital admissions. Over a long period of time, Patrick and his care team unpicked the aspects of his life that were impacting his physical and mental health, including housing, substance use, income support, social connections and living skills. Patrick's outcomes were improving, but finding housing that suited him was a real challenge. Providing Patrick with high density public housing, even with all the supports in the world, was never going to work due to his history of trauma and chronic homelessness. He struggles with feelings of safety while in housing. Patrick has tried a range of housing options, including different locations with different supports in place. And what we've found is that the most successful has been a single level dwelling with a garden and a mixed community of public and private housing. This is a very common story, but what this story tells us is that housing options need to be highly flexible and centered on an individual's needs. Without the ability to transfer or move to different housing, we find that clients walk out of their housing because staying there is detrimental to their mental health. And this also speaks to the support services needing to be flexible as well. Due to the nature of mental health, uh, support needs need to be dialed up and dialed down as people need it. Mental health is a chronic health issue. So support needs to mirror people's experience and their current setting. And when we dial it down because things are going smoothly or have improved, that doesn't mean withdrawing this support altogether. The importance of social connection cannot, also cannot be underestimated. And I reflect on how we used to support people into housing. We thought we had done a good job when we secured them a home and provided transitional support. But we now know that social isolation is something that we address at the start of people's care and continuing to work on long after they have tr transitioned into housing. Patrick and others like Patrick need to know that their support is not time limited nor conditional. We are still on a journey with Patrick. He does not have a team of workers. He is in fact one of the team and he is the expert in his team. Patrick's story, like many uh, other people we know, exemplifies that wraparound integrated services, which are person-centred, assertive, coordinated and holistic, are the key to unlocking the door to recovery. Stories like Patrick's and Nigel's of resilience and survival are a powerful motivator for us all. Thanks for your time today. Many thanks. I told you people hear me. Can people hear me? No. Jenny, Jenny, your voice has gone like Roy, Roy Orbison deep and weird. Can people hear me? Yeah, that's better. That's much okay. better. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm playing around with uh, trying to get uh, rid of that crackle, um, but I knew it would be fraught. Um, so people can hear me now, it's all good? Beautiful, all right. Um, so thank you, Nicole. Thank you for uh, the health uh, perspective and so uh, consistent in, in the themes of wraparound uh, integrated support. Um, our next speaker is uh, Karen Walsh, the CEO of uh, Microprojects, Brisbane based. Uh, Karen uh, is a director with me on uh, the Board of Homelessness. Australia. She's led the development of MICA projects to become a key homelessness service provider in Brisbane, um, one that's uh, pioneered evidence-informed practice to improve the lives of the most disadvantaged and marginalised people. Uh, Karen's also a director of the Australian Alliance to End Homelessness. And uh, uh, Karen, it's great to have uh, your support and uh, to uh, hear from an organisation that walks the talk.
You're on mute, Karen. Yeah, just trying to find the button. One of those skills that we've learned <laughs> over the COVID period. Um, uh, thanks, Jenny, and thanks everybody for your contribution. It's been fantastic listening to um, people's insights, but also I think just uh, repositioning of our uh, commitment to see people as citizens in Australia, not just consumers of services when you hear the themes of what everyone has been saying. But I acknowledge the traditional owners and of the Jaguar and Turrbal people of Brisbane. And one of the things during COVID that, COVID that we are certainly recommitted to is really wanting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations to be governing the response to Indigenous people who both experience mental illness and who are homeless. Over the COVID period, it's been like 30% of the people we've supported have identified as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And we, with all of the things that everybody has said, um, you know, about wraparound support, integration with community, integration with culture, um, we would really like to see more leadership and investment into integrating with the primary um, health services that are so innovative and have led the way in integrated healthcare across um, Australia for 40, 50 years now. Um, look, I don't want to repeat or anything that anyone's already said, and um, but my, my reflections of, of the last few months and where we're at now are that more than ever, I think we do have to um, consider how we do keep campaigning around the needs of, of people who are homeless, people with a mental health um, experience, and and this lack, this whole issue of siloed approaches to people's lives, and that somehow we as NGOs are engaged in transactions of support rather than in a holistic response to people that we can't just work with the individual on one issue anymore. We can't ignore the community, which, you know, other speakers have spoken to. And I, th I think when I think of my time in the non-government sector, that's what's been lost over the growth of the sector. It's been this transactional relationship around what you do with an individual. And so many of us struggle to fit in <laughs> all those things that we know are so critical to being part of a community, um, having a community welcome people, having people feel like they belong. None of these things are easy transactional things to just tick off in a service agreement. And I think that we really need to refocus that as NGOs, um, you know, there's such great experience and innovation. We can lift the voice of people like Nigel and other people who are experiencing the realities of um, you know, suddenly being left behind as we're beginning to see now. Like it was great seeing what Australia did with the National Cabinet, which Bronwyn and other people have mentioned. But as we get into the recovery phase, we're not seeing that same um, commitment. It was only this week I was interviewed by someone um, who told me that, you know, one person, a politician had said, oh, well, that's another jurisdiction's responsibility. I think it's just really sad when it comes to, um, you know, across Australia, thousands of people have been placed in motels. Um, and whilst we can think, isn't that, I don't know, but, you know, it's certainly great that people had to get off the streets for their health and the health of the community. And so they weren't fined because people were getting fines if they were in overcrowded households or they were living on the street. So, but I'm worried that that national solidarity and when it comes to housing, homeless, mental health is beginning to drop, that um, we haven't seen a unified approach to recovery um, for people who are the most disadvantaged, who are the most disadvantaged citizens. And I think that, you know, we really do need a national approach to having a housing and mental health plan, because as people have said, there is not one size fits all. There are people who need a whole range of different things. And sometimes they need to experiment with what they want, as um, was just said around um, co-health's experience of, you know, finding that right place for a person. 
And often we don't have the ability to do that. Once people fail, they're ticked off, they're excluded. But the other thing that has really um, come to me over the last few months is we have a law and order response to mental health that really needs to change. <laughs> like the reason why people don't want people coming into their community is they think the police cars are going to turn up when someone's actually unwell. And I think we need more community-based responses that don't stigmatise, that don't discriminate, that really are about healthcare. They're not about a person's health and well-being. They're not about having the police having to manage um, behaviour that could be managed just as well by someone with really good um, skills of, of dealing with someone in a psychosis or, an, or a critical situation. So I think that we just have to, to really put forward all of the information we know, the sustaining tenancy models, the housing rental models, the support models, but the con that opportunity that um, Matt, the, uh, the first speaker, what was his name? The oh, you see, I'm a Queenslander. <laughs> um, <laughs> He, um, he said about the opportunity for an integrated response that, um, it, you know, we really need to take that opportunity up. But unfortunately, we don't want to leave people being left behind. And, and Jenny, I'd just like to affirm Parity and um, CHP for really being at the forefront of keeping the evidence of the sector, the innovation and the voices of people with lived experience into the debate. And one day, I just hope soon, we'll, we'll see the fruits of some of that work because I think the recovery process is not putting a lot of Australians centre to it. It's, they're beginning to be left behind. And, you know, once we see the income issues, you know, it's all going to take a spiral down. So let's keep working together to get the spiral going up again. Thanks, Karen, and thanks for um, Ica's involvement uh, with Parity, uh, including uh, with this addition, and I think for building on uh, Nicole's emphasis around integration with primary healthcare, which you've always uh, championed, but also pointing to the burning bridge that we have of all these people in hotels. And uh, I think I'm um, increasingly becoming concerned our community's willingness to, to see those people drift back uh, to the streets uh, without uh, support and without getting a housing income. So we've got, we've got the fight ahead of us. So thank you. Um, our next and final speaker in this particular part of the launch uh, is uh, Owen uh, Kalaki, uh, the head of, and uh, Professor Kalaki is the head of functional recovery in youth mental health at Origin and the Centre for Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. Um, and most recently, he's developed a framework for global youth mental health in collaboration with the World uh, Economic uh, Forum. And Owen, welcome. And it will be uh, great to hear um, um, Origin's um, perspective on housing and support. Thanks, Jenny, and thanks for, for having me. Um, when you get to be at the end of a, a list of people like that, I think it might, it's very tempting to just say, you know, what they said. And, and be done with it. But um, I've got a few other things I, I, I might say. I might also start by paying my respects to um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I live. Um, acknowledge that they've never ceded their um, sovereignty of this country and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, at Origin, we work with young people and uh, in terms of mental illness, that's really important because we know that 75% of mental illness uh, emerges by the time that people are 25 years old. And a consequence of that is that a number of the important developmental tasks that happen uh, through late adolescence and into to early adulthood can often be really compromised. And those are things like, you know, finishing your education, transitioning into employment, um, and establishing yourself as, a, as an independent uh, adult, including you know, living uh, independently. Uh, so if the onset of mental illness can get in the way of these things and, and cause quite a range um, of problems. So for young people uh, at the intersection of mental illness and, and homelessness, um, one of the problems that I think we've 
they they confront and I think Karen just mentioned it is this idea of silos and you know it seems to me that these silos are kind of everywhere and they must make sense from from some sort of top-down kind of place but they just don't make sense in the lives of young people or probably any people because people have multi-domain problems they, they don't have these kind of neat problems that that fit across these um these siloed kind of approaches um, we know too from a lot of research that there's a, a bi-directional vulnerability between mental illness and homelessness we know that um, people who've experienced mental illness are more likely to experience homelessness and, and vice versa um, but one of the things that we also know is that around about a third of young people who are experiencing um, mental illness and homelessness uh, are likely to access services. So there's two thirds who, who aren't accessing the support or they're not aware of the support services that they, they might get. And I think there's a range of reasons for this. Part of it is, I think, the way that we set up mental health services. Um, quite often, I think these services are set up much more around the needs of staff than they are of the clients who we're meant to be uh, serving. And if you look at a lot of the outpatient services that we have, they're sort of, you know, they, they work from nine to five. Um, you know, one of the things that we do a lot in our work is try to help young people back into school and work. And if we're successful with that, then they can't actually attend their um, mental health appointments. So we've got to start building services that are centred around the people that we're trying to work with. Similarly, you know, Headspace has been a great initiative across the country, but I think one of the things that's really lacking in the Headspace model is a capacity for outreach to, to work with young people who won't necessarily come into the centre or who don't even know about the, the centre. So being able to go out and meet those young people where they are uh, and, and work with them. And I think that's particularly important for vulnerable communities of young people, whether it's around homelessness, uh, transition from out of home care or, or other groups like that. Um, I think even in specialist services, we can do a, a lot better. One of my most earliest memories, and admittedly, this was in the last millennia, um, but one of my most earliest memories as a student doing a placement uh, in a specialist mental health setting was that people were being discharged from the inpatient unit to a caravan park with a couple of nights paid for but the caravan park was out of area. So after those couple of nights, it'll be another health services problem. And we've got a you know, long time since I've seen that, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that somewhere I could find that same kind of attitude. Um, a number of years ago, we looked at um, admission accommodation and discharge accommodation for some of the young people coming through our ward. And we found around about 10% of young people being discharged into less secure accommodation and the accommodation that they had come from. And I think one of the things that we could do in this area, quite simply, is to make sure that nobody gets discharged into less secure accommodation than the accommodation that they came from, even if that means that they need to stay you know, in, the, in the hospital for a little bit longer till we find the appropriate accommodation. But the accommodation that we find, particularly for young people, I think has to be secure, um, and long lasting because there's a range of developmental tasks that they need to do, whether it's, a, like I said, around education, employment, learning how to be an independent adult. And the basis for that has to be a secure place to live, you know, as, as it is, you know, for those of us who are lucky to have had that in our lives, um, we need to make sure that they have a guarantee that they'll be there for long enough to do these things whether that's a few months or a few years, and it needs to be a, a safe kind of, you know, housing first kind of approach. The two, or the final thing I'd say is, you know, when I look at the mental health services we have, um, and particularly those which have got some outreach around homelessness, there doesn't seem to have been a lot of co-design. We're not sitting down with the young people who are experiencing these problems and asking them what do they need the services to look like and how do they need the services to perform um, for them? And I think that a key thing in, in the development of, of these things going forward will be a, a co-design approach with the young people who um, are experiencing these things. So thank you. Many thanks, Owen, and uh, thanks so much for uh, Origin's uh, involvement and hopefully we'll continue the relationship and, um, um, 
thanks for pointing to the you know specific needs of uh, young people and the tailored response that we need for them and um, for giving me bi-directional vulnerability I think I'll uh, be bringing that out again um, so uh, thanks to all the speakers in this part of the launch um, and um, I think it's um, a number but Karen in particular exhorted us to we are going to have to continue to advocate hard for the accessible and appropriate social housing that's going to lay the foundations for uh, the support for uh, people uh, exiting homelessness with mental health issues. Uh, now, uh, we are going to run a little bit over time and uh, despite my best bullying efforts, and uh, so I apologise for that and hope that most of you can stay with us. We're very fortunate to have two keynote speakers to uh, complete uh, this morning's uh, presentations and it uh, in terms of depth of knowledge and understanding of both homelessness and housing and mental health issues uh, it, it would be hard to beat. Uh, our first uh, speaker in this section is Jenny Sams. Uh, Jenny is a member of the Monash Uni Council, uh, director of the CHP and the FOIA Foundation and undertakes consultancy work uh, mainly in the not-for-profit uh, sector and uh, Jenny's depth of experience uh, in uh, government, uh, deputy secretary, executive roles, um, trying to improve the educational employment opportunities uh, for all Victorians, but also as former CEO of Aboriginal Housing Victoria, uh, where um, that organisation became the only Aboriginal organisation to achieve housing association status and also uh, successfully negotiated the historic transfer of nearly 1,500 DHHS properties to Aboriginal Housing Victoria uh, that they were already managing. Jenny, thank you so much for being with us today and very much look forward to your views about housing support in the context of mental health issues. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and thank you all. And um, it's been quite a long session and I'll try not to repeat stuff. Um, I'll try and be sharp and to the point as best I can and thank you for those who are still listening. Uh, of course, I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners. I'm on Wurundjeri land, but um, acknowledge traditional owners of the many lands we're all meeting on. Uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the land was never ceded. And thank you, Jenny, for mentioning my former role as CEO of Aboriginal Housing Victoria. And that's an experience I draw on and I'm still working very, very um, closely with the organisation and talk about grabbing an opportunity. Um, I think because of a lot of the groundwork we had done in policy and elsewhere, um, the money that the Victorian government's putting into um, a sort of building um, maintenance kickstart package, um, those funds are being uh, determined by Aboriginal organisations in partnership with Aboriginal Housing Victoria. So that's $35 million that we together um, are building the bid on and we're going extremely well with it, touch wood. So sometimes, you know, out of crisis comes a real opportunity. Uh, and we've also got another smaller program which actually does a little will do a little bit in terms of those wraparound and support services. So thank you for that. Um, many of you will have noticed um, just recently in the context of the refresh of the Close the Gap strategy that um, the National Coalition of Peaks prepared a report um, based on 4,000 responses and suggested some new targets. And I think it's really telling. Uh, mental health and the preservation of culture and languages were part of the response, part of what they wanted to see um, targets on in the Close the Gap refresh. Uh, I don't find it surprising these are mentioned together. I think mental health issues in the Aboriginal community um, are often different in their genesis, and I guess we can say that about all people. I don't want to generalise. We can say that about all people and all groups. but. Um, Intergenerational dispossession from land, culture and removal of children have had a devastating effect. And I think one of the things you've got to understand with all of this, and particularly Victoria, I can't talk about other parts of the country, but in the early years, Aboriginal people bounced back. They developed their own economy. They developed different ways of living. But the, the steps they took were constantly removed. And the spirit... 
spirituality and connection with land and culture are so important. You combine the two and people's spirit was broken. And I think this is what we see in First Nations people in many parts of the world. And it's the fundamental difference, I've come to believe. It's the breaking of your spirit. And for Aboriginal people and indeed many others, once your spirit's broken, your mental health's really very, very badly affected. In fact, you've got a serious mental health issue. And that's what's coming through in the contemporary experience of um, Aboriginal people in Australia. In Victoria, we've uh, recently um, developed and launched an Aboriginal housing and homelessness framework, 18 months work based extensively on community consultation, community feedback. But for us, the important thing was that housing and homelessness are seen as one system, one integrated set of interventions, supports and proactive um, responses and that the broader experience of Aboriginal people, including mental health, are front and centre of everything that um, you do. And I think because that framework was endorsed in February, it really has set us up well in terms of making use of additional money, stimulus money going out and a self-determining approach. Um, as we all know, housing distress and mental health um, are mutually reinforcing. Mental health is a driver of one in four presentations by Aboriginal people to homelessness services Australia-wide. At Aboriginal Housing Victoria and our annual, or biannual, um, tenant satisfaction surveys, people, one in three people were reporting that they had mental health issues. And if anything, it's probably higher because there's a real sense of shame in admitting this. So uh, we were, frankly taken aback and it keeps on each time you do the um, survey it's not one off a third of your people have mental health issues and as one of the earlier speakers said people can establish themselves everything's going well and then it hits again so um, we need to address both if we're going to um, have satisfactory housing outcomes going back and this had a big impact on me in 2006. The WA Child Health Survey, the work that Fiona Stanley was undertaking, was seminal because what it showed was that Aboriginal children experiencing life stress events in clusters um, are incomprehensibly high. Um, one in five experience seven or more major life stress events each year. So, you know, someone in the family dying, going to jail, losing their jobs, becoming seriously ill. We know, particularly from our um, community consultations for the framework, but just from our practical experience and living in the community, um, it's a massively malignant clustering of mini disasters in Aboriginal communities, and that drives homelessness. Um, and I want to just make a point here around homelessness. And one of the things, again, I'm becoming very sharply aware of, the mental health issues for everyone and in Aboriginal communities drive homelessness. One of the things we've got to be very careful of more broadly is when we're uh, developing other social uh, policy and um, interventions, programs, actions, you need to be very, very careful of perverse um, outcomes. You do not want to attract Aboriginal people away from their communities because of something other action you're taking. Now, sometimes there's a need to leave, uh, leave community. I'm not arguing that at all. But you've got to be careful in terms of what's happening because when people are away from community, they are away from the community and social structures. They are away from any influence of their elders. They form new mobs and those mobs have got to be respected and the uh, friendship and support are very important. And you can't break those uh, mobs up um, because you know, you happen to find a house for someone who's homeless 20k away, for instance. But you really, when you dislocate people, it becomes very, very complex when um, the community and cultural strength is removed. There will be other strengths in those sort of transitory mobs. I'm not denying that, but it's a very, very big issue to watch for. Um, one of the things that's very distinctive uh, in terms of um, Aboriginal mental health and homelessness issues is, uh, again, the level of homelessness in um, Aboriginal communities. 
And despite being around all of this for so long, when we dug down into the data, we learnt that Aboriginal homelessness in Victoria is the highest rate in the country. That's measured on people presenting to homelessness services. Um, if you translated it into the uh, rate for the general community, you'd be talking about a million Victorians um, needing homelessness assistance. And that's based on first time presentation. So it really is a very, very um, bad situation. Why is it worse in Victoria? Uh, I can't fully answer it, but I think it is at the heart of it is the, dis the dispossession in Victoria was so quick, so fast and so harsh that people have, as Shirley Firebrace said at the, one of the community consultations, being homeless in your own country is a truly dreadful place to be. And I think that's what we're seeing. So um, I'd also add to it, and I'm gonna finish pretty quickly because I know it's uh, been a long session. Um, and it goes back a bit to my comment about being careful of perverse outcomes in social policy. Transitional housing really, if anything, has a destructive effect. And I know, of course, we need it in emergency situations. I'm not denying that. But the downward spiral and the sense of inadequacy and hopelessness gets worse and worse each time you come in and out of transitional housing. People need a home. Um, and transitional housing is one of the areas, oh, I can see a spoodle up there. I hope mine keeps behaving in the background there. Transitional housing is, again, one of the areas you've got to be careful of um, because it does, you don't want it to create, create the illusion that it's offering a housing outcome in another area when, in fact, it's really not. It can make things worse. Um, so people do need housing. They need support in that housing. Uh, and I'm very, very briefly going to mention a program that's been underway in Aboriginal Housing Victoria in the Northern region for about three years now and is going very well, but like everything, it's funded as a pilot. So <laughs> just as you build relationships with people, your pilot might come to an end or it might not. Um, the bane of government funding approaches. It's called More Than a Landlord. The idea of the um, program is that Aboriginal housing tenants and a lot of, interestingly, a lot of public housing tenants want to be part of this. Um, we just didn't have capacity. Um, provides support to all tenants who want to be part of it, but particularly those under stress. And we've had quite a few people who've come in and there's been one, um, fella and his daughters, and it's been in the paper, newspapers, this one. I'm not going to name him, obviously, but he came in with severe mental health problems. Um, Aboriginal organisations um, garnered support around him. He's part of the More Than a Landlord programs, remain part of it. Fantastic father to his young daughters. He's had the odd sort of slip up here and there. The programs supported him, and really, it's just such a success. But in very simple terms, what happens? Um, we focus on strengths and aspirations. It's not about deficits. It's about community-led um, promotions and initiatives. It's about uh, creating opportunities for tenants to socially engage and participate. In other words, building the strength in communities. Um, and working from the basis of life coaching and life plans around your aspirations. So some people are moving into work, and I'm not saying that's the goal with everything, but um, that's what some people are doing. Um, when people can be good parents, their housing's stable, their housing's clean and healthy, you know, and safe, that to us is a major success. The lead tenant might not go back to work, but their kids might be going to school, and that's exactly what we want. So it's um, a very simple and obvious model when you think about it, but it's like all of those things. Why doesn't it happen more often? And why can't we get ongoing funding? Because of course, um, people build a reliance and dependency and friendship with their so-called life coach, and you really can't have them disappear tomorrow. So that's all I'm going to say, because I think everything else has been covered by other speakers who um, were fantastic and will be doing some follow-up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny, and, um, you know,
thanks for being with today, being on the CHP board and for uh, sharing your expertise in relation to uh, Aboriginal housing and homelessness and I think underlining the, um, the foundational issue that we have with the impact of colonisation and disposition and the breaking of the spirit of the Aboriginal people uh, as well as the importance of community avoiding perverse outcomes and um, the limited value of uh, transitional responses. Um, so we come to our final speaker and Leanne, I'm so sorry to have done this to you, um, to uh, get you um, uh, at this end of the day, but uh, Leanne Bagley uh, is the new CEO of Mental Health Australia and she's really kindly joined us today. Uh, Mental Health Australia being the uh, peak body, uh, the national peak body for mental health. Um, we know uh, Leanne from her many years working in Melbourne and now she's headed to uh, Canberra from where she joins us today. I've known Leanne since uh, the early days of her mental health career, which has uh, spanned clinical mental health services, a clinician and uh, a leader, uh, and then the Victorian State Government where uh, she was the Director of Mental Health and Drugs at DHHS, and then more recently, uh, Primary Care, where she was CEO of the Western uh, Victorian Primary Health Network. Um, Leanne, it's great to have the opportunity to introduce you to our sector uh, in your new role and uh, uh, to have you share uh, the perspective of Mental Health Australia. Thanks, Jenny, and um, thanks for having me in the introduction and the invitation. Also about me is that my late husband, Bill, and I have three daughters all in their 20s. And the middle one, Sarah, is a lawyer and a very new police officer. And she was working last weekend in Melbourne City on night duty, patrolling the streets, and she called me to debrief the next day. She and her colleague had approached a rough sleeper on a cold night and offered him um, a hotel room as part of the government's current housing program. And she called me to talk through her experience. She couldn't understand his declining the offer. She saw it as an opportunity for warmth, shower, rest and food. And I asked her what he said about why he didn't want to go. And her take was that he was comfortable with what he knew and he didn't trust the cops or the government. I've no idea if he was struggling with mental ill health or not. He left quite an impression on my girl though, who's been thinking about it all week and thinking about him and what might happen to him and why he found himself there. Um, and I wanted to launch with that because um, you know, this is one of the ongoing complex problems. Housing instability, homelessness and mental illness are too often intertwined and we do so poorly at times with it as a society that we're not surprised when people living with this complexity don't trust authorities or they find a way to be comfortable in a place that many could not tolerate. Um, I'd just like to join in acknowledging that country and say that I'm on Ngunnawal land in uh, Canberra and it's cold. I'd just like to add. <laughs> we know that there's an increasing awareness of the social determinants of mental ill health. The syst systemic disadvantages and circumstances that mean some people are far more likely to experience severe psychological distress than others. And we know that housing instability is one of these factors and we've heard about it this morning from a range of amazing experts. Traditionally, we've tried to address these different needs through distinct programs and service models, but for people living with mental illness and housing insecurity, it's always been clear that these challenges and helpful response, responses are really um, inherently interconnected and our service approaches, research and policy are finally catching up to this. And I guess what I'm here to say is that our, our governments need to catch up to this as well. Historically, the inherent interconnectedness of housing, security and mental wellbeing is clear from the data. And while COVID-19 pandemic has caused huge disruption to service provision, it's also created opportunities, as we've heard this morning, for different ways to respond and re-engage, like the provision of hotel accommodation for people sleeping rough. The challenge now is to reshape and improve our service systems to better support those in search of a home and those in need of mental health services. So, um, why is appropriate housing so important for mental health and wellbeing? Well, we've heard about that this morning. A home is, you know, more, um, is about having more than just four walls and a roof. It should provide safety and security, enable access to support services and support the development of a sense of self and community connection. I think Laura called it citizenship. 
The importance of appropriate housing for positive mental health and wellbeing was acknowledged by the Productivity Commission inquiry into mental health draft report when they said, suitable housing, that is housing that's secure, affordable, of reasonable quality and enduring tenure, is particularly important factor in preventing mental ill health and a first step in promoting long-term recovery for people experiencing mental illness. Um, so what are the gaps in our system now? Clearly, um, the current system doesn't meet the level of need. According to the Productivity Commission, again, over half of all clients of homelessness services in need of long and medium term housing did not receive it. I'll say it again, over half did not receive it. About one third of clients with mental ill health needed but did not receive mental health services. Overall, there's a shortage of appropriate housing options for people with lived experience of mental ill health. And the trajectories research found that this is related to decreasing housing affordability, social housing shortages and the lack of supportive housing. Mental Health Australia absolutely supports policy moves to enforce no exits to homelessness from hospitals, mental health services, drug and alcohol services and prisons. However, the introduction of these policies is not enough without provision of appropriate accommodation options. In some cases, it has just meant that people stay in institutions because there is no other place for them to go. The real need is developing increased availability of housing options. Surveys highlighted again in the Productivity Commission suggested around 30% of admitted patients, which is about 2,000 people, in psychiatric inpatient units could be discharged if appropriate housing and community services were available. The cost of not adequately addressing the accommodation needs of people with mental illness is evident um, through increased expenditure in the health sector in some cases, um, the justice system as well. The good news, I guess, is that research shows the effectiveness of interventions and we have heard about some great programs this morning Lovely to hear about doorways, which I was involved with when I was the Director of Mental Health in Victoria a few years ago. The trajectories research says the quantitative analysis shows that mediating factors such as social support, good general health and accessing mental health and other health services can reduce the likelihood of housing instability and shorten the time a person experiences mental ill health. So what do we need to do? Australia already hosts several innovative, high-performing services and models of effective housing support with a mental illness. People, sorry, with a mental illness. And these service models are not waiting to be invented. They're just waiting to be supported and expanded and given some, some longevity. Reforming the system will mean looking at it from the experience of people accessing services. This is what the trajectories research has done mapping the real journeys of people experiencing mental health issues um, in the housing support system, which are of course rarely linear. We know where long-term supported housing has been provided for people living with mental illness, there's been significant associated reductions in the use of health, justice and community services. And we need governance to recognise the links between mental ill health and homelessness and provide investment in service reform across both sectors and together. They should actively work towards meeting the gap in supported housing places and homelessness services. Um, we know there's a proven link between homelessness and mental illness. We know that most recently the bushfires and the COVID-19 pandemic have included significant emphasis on mental health planning and support provision. And we know that we're awaiting a whole lot of final reports from the Productivity Commission inquiry into mental health, as well as the findings of the Royal Commission in Victoria. What we don't know is how all the governments will prioritise mental health and homelessness, prioritise it while also recovering from bushfire and dealing with the pandemic and the existing and expected economic impact across our country. At Mental Health Australia, we'll continue to advocate for increasing access to appropriate housing and integrated mental health and housing supports, which are the key to tackling this problem. Congratulations from us to you on this great publication launched by Minister Foley today and for keeping this issue front and centre in our minds. It was great to hear the experts on this intersecting work. Thank you especially to Nigel for telling his story. He said first that people were kind. 
If we can do this together, we will ultimately address people's basic need for a place to call home and then a community to feel part of. Laura called this full citizenship in a welcoming community. Thanks for having me, Jen. Oh, thanks for being here, Leanne, and it's so great to have you uh, in this national role and uh, having you here today uh, to meet everybody, I think, uh, in Thank that you. role. As, as a start, I think, of, of a lot more work together to come and I think um, underlining uh, just the foundational need for the, the range of housing and support that that is required um, and that we do have the service models, we've just got to take them to, to scale, um, as well as the opportunity that, uh, gosh, we're all desperately trying to see realised in terms of social housing as stimulus in this uh, COVID-19 uh, set of circumstances. Thanks so much. All right, well, that does bring us to the conclusion of uh, this virtual parity launch. Thanks so much. Uh, for the 60 of you who are still there on the line uh, today. Uh, thanks to all the contributors at nearly 100 pages. I think it uh, demonstrates uh, the, the understanding of the importance of housing and support as integral to the spot response to mental health issues. Uh, thanks to Noel for another fine addition. All of today's presenters, an unbelievably stellar lineup. Uh, again, to the edition sponsors, and uh, also that the uh, event is being recorded and will be available to others who may be interested. Um, and of course, don't be backward in coming forward to Noel if you've uh, got any thoughts about uh, future parity contributions. Thanks heaps. Uh, probably see many of you quite soon in another one of these virtual fora. Have a great day.